So I'm going to give uh, some people just a couple more minutes to get logged in. I see attendees are still showing up. Um, and we will get started in uh, just a couple minutes. So thanks for coming today. We really appreciate having you guys here. We could talk about the tournament that starts tomorrow. Uh, you know, this will actually be the first day or the first year in 20 years that I have not filled out a bracket or or anything. And my I finished mine. <laughs> My undergraduate school, Jacksonville State University, actually made the tournament this year. So, Oh, nice. It's probably best that I don't because they're going to lose, and I would feel compelled to put them through at least one win just out of loyalty instead of picking the right thing. So it's probably <laughs> best. <laughs> what seed are they? Um, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. Troy State made it into. That's another small school in Alabama. But I think they played Duke in the first day. So we all know how that's Ah, uh, they do. Yep. So, yeah. I don't know what seed Jacksonville State is, but go Gamecocks. <laughs> so. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Welcome to um, the second webinar during International Women's Month in March. Um, today we're going to have Erin Stellato. Um, if you're not already a member of the past Women in Technology chapter, I encourage you to do so. Um, the sessions are not all just us talking about gender issues. Today, obviously, we have Erin um, Stellato talking about extended events. Um, we've had uh, BI topics, uh, Oracle topics, uh, Kate Grass did one on BIML. Uh, so I have a wide variety of topics. I encourage you to join the Women in Technology group um, and get the newsletter so that you'll know everything that's coming up. Uh, Century One, of course, is our sponsor. I will be picking a winner today from the attendees. Uh, to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So ex if, if you win, expect an email from me, um, and I'll be passing your information along to Century One so that they can uh, notify you about that. Um, be sure that you check out our YouTube channel. We do record and upload all of our WIT sessions, and this one hopefully will be available later this afternoon. Our homepage, uh, wit.sequelpass.org, I think since the change, um, wit.pass.org also works. You can follow us on Twitter, at pass under bar wit, or follow the pass wit hashtag. In addition, I'd like to encourage you to use the pass wit, wit hashtag um, each week. Uh, I and the pass wit account tweet uh, about articles that we read, about female speakers in the SQL community with the pass wit hashtag. And um, any female speaker uh, who is presenting at a SQL Saturday in the upcoming weeks. Um, this Saturday we have Iceland and Richmond. And I actually, on this list, I'm so proud to see Judith Moffat. I used to work with her uh, in Virginia Beach, and we are still friends, so I'm excited that she's speaking. Uh, we also have Montreal and Birmingham. Um, and so those two are coming up. Uh, next week, the Women in Technology session will be Kaylin Delaney, uh, Seeking SQL Server Secrets. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Kaylin. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter as well, at SQL Queen is, I think, what hers is. Um, but she's going to be talking about tips and tricks and some references uh, that she's found in articles, blog posts, or what's worked for her. The following week, on March 29th, I will be presenting my session on identifying and combating gender bias and inequality. I've done this at a few SQL Saturdays now, and it's gone over really well. So um, that will be our fourth and final session for International Women's Month. And we are soliciting um, speakers for April and May, because June we already have scheduled, I believe, is Jess Borland. She's going to do a professional development talk, and July will be Melissa Coates. 
and um, that will be uh, a BI data warehouse talk. I just don't remember the exact topic. But today we have Aaron Stellato, Kicking and Screaming, Replacing Profiler with Extended Events. Um, and obviously if you're here, you know why you're here. So I am going to go ahead and um, think, turn this over to Aaron whenever she's ready. Um, I will mute my mic, Aaron. But if there's anything that you need from me, just let me know and I will still be here. So. All right, sounds great. Can you see my PowerPoint, just to make sure? Yes, I can. Awesome. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining me today, either over your lunch hour, an early lunch, a mid-morning, or just rolling in, perhaps. Um, rolling in being like 9 a.m. Or, you know, maybe I'm assuming that's U.S., right? Maybe you're over in Europe and it's end of day and this is how you're going to end your day, whatever it is. Thank you for joining. And just a couple quick intro slides to go through. The most important thing on this slide is my email, Aaron at SQLSkills.com. If you've got any questions about this session, please feel free to email me or reach out on Twitter at Aaron Stilato. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I am a member of the SQL Skills team, and if you're not um, familiar with the team, it's owned by Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp, and then the colleagues that I work with every day, they're a wonderful team, Glenn Berry, Jonathan Cahayas, and Tim Radney. And we provide consulting services, health checks, performance tuning upgrades, um, migrations to Azure, remote DBA services. We also provide training through our immersion events and online through Pluralsight and through user group virtual chapter sessions like this and at conferences like the summer. At an intersection. If you want to hear from us on a regular basis, you can become an insider. The link is down there at the bottom. And if you're interested in our classes, uh, you can hit our training page. We have those coming up in April and May and then some in the fall as well. And if you're interested in working with us on a consulting basis, hit our services page. We definitely would be happy to talk to you. This is one of my favorite slides. Actually, I think it's a favorite of all team members because we give out Paul's email address, paul at sqlskills.com. If you have not ever experienced Pluralsight, then I definitely recommend that you email Paul directly to get a free code. We've got over 150 hours at this point of content out there. I've got a couple classes um, as examples here. It's a 30-day trial. There's no catch. And you can see what Pluralsight has to offer and what the SQL Skills team has to offer. Um, I do have a course out there related to this exact topic today. So we've only got an hour. It's really not a lot of time to dive into extended events, which is why I kind of just have two items to cover here. How to transition from what you know and love about Profiler and Trace over to extended events, and then we'll hit upon some performance killers. If you've got questions, please type them in the question window. I'll look at those as we're going through and definitely address them. Um, there's no silly question, so please ask away. So we're going to start by just making sure we're clear on what extended events is. And it's not just a replacement for trace. It, it is a replacement for trace, but that's not just how I want you to think about it. It's an event handling system for SQL Server, and it allows you to correlate events that are happening inside SQL Server with data related to those events so that you can understand what's going on within SQL Server. And you have the ability in extended events to create these really complex and flexible event sessions to capture data that we didn't have the ability to do with Tracer Profiler. And extended events was made available in SQL Server 2008. And it didn't get a lot of attention until SQL Server 2012 because there was no UI. And as much as we like um, code, right, and doing things with T-SQL and with script, there's something about having a UI when you're trying to learn a new feature. Uh, so I think that there wasn't a huge adoption uh, initially because of this. And there was a of, also a lot of great features in 2008. So Extended Events is part of SQL OS, the Extended Events Engine lives within OS, and that's actually a, a point where SQL Server interacts, uh, or excuse me, with Extended Events interacts with other modules within the SQL Server code. 
mode. And when we talk about extended events, you're going to hear a lot of different vocabulary words, some of which you're familiar with, like an event. And uh, you'll hear target and predicate and action and type and map and package. All of those items are part of different packages within SQL Server. And it's just how this information for extended events, this, these objects for extended events, are organized. So you've got these different packages that have different events, predicates, actions, targets, types, and maps. And they, there's multiple packages based on the different modules in SQL Server. And they interact with one another. And this is actually a, a big thing about the flexibility of extended events because as new features are introduced into the product in different modules they can be added into extended events so it's it's not really a static feature it's very flexible and it changes as the features in SQL Server change and we're going to start right away with a demo to look at what you know and love with Profiler and Trace and how we make that migration over to extended events so let's hop into Management Studio. So everybody should be able to see Management Studio at this point. And we're going to go into that beloved tool of Profiler. And I, I joke because I grew up with Profiler. I like to say that I grew up with Profiler and I grew up with Perfmon. Those were two of the first tools that I worked with when troubleshooting in SQL Server. And I understand people's adoration, their love for those tools. Profiler was introduced in SQL Server 7.0, which was released in 1998. That tool has been around then for 19 years. It's a legal adult. Um, but and, it, and it's worked well, but it's kind of time to move on. So what we would normally do with Profiler is we would come in and create a new trace and we'd connect to our instance. And once we connect, you have the option of dropping into the events tab and selecting the different events that you wanted, but this could be time consuming. Right? How much time have you guys spent scrolling in this window looking for the events that you want or, you know, my favorite, once you found the event, because, and honestly, I never remember where these are after so many years, uh, finding the event and then clicking all the boxes that you wanted or didn't want, really time consuming. So what I tended to use when I used Trace was a template. So I'm going to do that here. We're going to select this high reads template within SQL Server and then uh, select the template that we want and if we go into events you'll see I'm not going to show all events at this point you'll see that I've got two events selected RPC completed and SQL statement completed and I ha have just a set of the columns that I care about checked here so this makes starting up um, a session pretty easy right and if we look in my filters you'll see that I have a filter for reads. I'm filtering on reads greater than or equal to 10,000. I always recommend that you have a filter when you set up a trace. Um, I don't have the ability to have you like raise your hands or ask you directly, which is probably a good thing, if you've ever set up a trace with no filter. If you have, you might know that um, you can actually bring down a system depending on the events you've selected and depending upon the workload. So after we've selected our filter, and in this case, again, just reads greater than or equal to 10,000, then you can go ahead and say run. And if you did this and then let this run, I want to encourage you to stop doing that. What you really want to do is stop this trace immediately, and then you want to run it as a server-side trace, because this right here, this profiler UI, is very, very expensive. It running this and having the data flow into this UI generates a lot of overhead in SQL Server. So what's more efficient is to export this out to a script. So we'll just save this. And then we're going to open it with the Management Studio and run that as a server-side trace. So again, if this is something that you're familiar with, you've done this lots and lots of times. But I want to walk through this script. And I have a copy of this exact same script script, but I've just commented it. So I've opened that here. We're going to close the original one that I've saved. And I want to make sure that, that you understand what's happening in this script. So the first part of this is declaring some variables, and then we run this SP trace create, which gets the, gets the trace definition started. And you'll notice that we specify a path here, because we're going to write this out to a file. If we're not looking at the data in the UI, which is expensive, then we need to save it somewhere, which is going to be out to a file. By the way, I don't ever recommend writing this data to a table. There's a lot of overhead involved with that as well. So here's the file where we're going to write the data. And then below that, we set our event. 
months. And unless you happen to have done this thousands of times or you've got some kind of photographic memory or you have books online open, you probably don't remember that SP trace set event and then the trace ID and then 10 comma 1 means that I'm turning on the RPC completed event and I'm capturing the text data column. And you notice I have all of these commented here because this is how it's done with trace. This SP trace set event store procedure and then every event and column combination that you want to see. So we've got this for RPC completed and then we also have this for SQL statement completed. And if we keep scrolling down, we see we have a section where the filters, and this is this big int filter is the one that we set for reads. That's not intuitive, right? But SP trace, SP trace set filter is how that gets set. And then the last thing that we see is our SP trace set status, where the trace starts. And then it displays for us that trace ID when we're finished. So if we go ahead and fire that up, we see that the trace now has a, we have a trace ID of two. That's what's actively running. And if you you run fn trace get info, you'll see that we've got our default trace, which has a trace ID of one. The default trace is always running unless you've done something to it to turn it off. It almost always has an ID of one. And then any other traces that we start have subsequent numbers. If you ever start a trace as an aside and you see like your trace ID is 12, that's a red flag. Even if it's five, that's a red flag because that means that there's four other traces running in addition to the one that you've created. And at running lots and lots of those can definitely add overhead onto your system. But this is how we can create that same trace that we started with over here in the UI over in Management Studio, right, as a server-side trace. Now, how do I take this and go to Extended Events, which is a completely different interface and there's, you know, slightly different vocabulary. And the easiest thing for you to do, the easiest thing is to stay in that world of code, actually, that you know and love of and run a stored procedure. This is a stored procedure called SP SQL Skills Convert Trace to Extended Events. And it was written by Jonathan Cahayas on an airplane. Um, John is brilliant and I don't know how when he sits on an airplane he can write code. I would rather just sit there and read a book, but this is what he does. So this stored procedure is something that you can download from his blog and you input the trace ID Erin, I'm having some trouble hearing you. Um, I keep And then what it does, if we scroll down here, you'll start to see it, is he's looking to see mm, can anybody else let me know if they're having okay, I'm i I'm right next to my microphone. And yeah. I feel like I'm it's it's cutting um, out every shouting once in into it. <laughs> no, it's it's cutting out every once okay. in a while. So okay. I'll Were you still talking there? Because your, idiot, your audio cut out for me. Yeah. So let me see if it's my connection. Keep going, and I'll work on it here as quietly okay. as I can. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I am, I'm not moving around. I saw someone commented earlier that it was going in and out, so I'm staying pretty stationary um, right in front of the mic. So it, it could be I, – I made sure before we started that I'm not on my Wi-Fi, that I'm connected to um, – Nope, you're you. But I'm hardwired in. It's probably me, and I'll I'll work on it. So you just keep going. Okay, um, yeah, my network. It says my network quality and auto quality are good. So, okay, so I apologize for that. That I will try to slow down uh, to make that a little bit easier. So to reiterate, this code right here that Jonathan has does a conversion from what you've defined in trace over to the appropriate code within extended events. So if I run this store procedure and I've got that right here, all I need for the input is the trace ID. I have to have that trace defined in the system. It doesn't have to be running and right now mine is, um, but the trace has to be defined and you have to know what that trace ID is. So my trace ID is two, right? We had that output before. I'm going to specify my session name, which I'm declaring as XE reads filter trace here. And then I can say, I want you to print the output, which I do, so that's equal to one, but I don't want you to execute that. I don't want you to create this, the event session just yet. So we'll go ahead and run this. And it's going to generate the T-SQL to create the event session 
function which is comparable to the trace that we had created. So if I select all of this and copy and then open up a new window, here, here is that code. Now I have this code in a commented version as well. So I'm going to close this one and I'm going to close my store procedure and I'm going to leave my trace definition open and then we're going to open up the create session syntax and we're going to look at these two side by side. This is how we're going to make that leap from what we know to extended events. So we start on the left with that section to create a queue and then our SP trace create. Now in our extended events code at the very beginning there's a check to see if this event session exists and then it's a drop. This is something that Jonathan has added in to the stored procedure. It's not something that's part of creating an event session that syntax. Where it really starts is here. Create event session and then the name of the event session on the server. So this first chunk right here is analogous to SP trace create. Now with our SP trace create, we do have a path. We're going to hit that later, so just kind of hold on to that for the moment. The next part that we have on the event session is to add the event. And what we had next on the trace side was to add the event and the columns. So again, remember we had SP trace set event and the event column combination. And on the right, we have add event. And notice here that it's very easy to read, right? RPC completed. I know exactly what event this is. I don't have to go to books online or remember that 10 equals RPC completed. Beneath that, we have our actions. Now, if you look at this list of actions and you look at this list of columns on the left from trace, you'll notice that they, we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship here. You'll see client app name and client PID and database ID, but you don't see on the right side duration. You don't see reads, you don't see writes, you don't see CPU. And this is because there's a fundamental difference between trace and extended events. Extended events has for each event what's called a default payload. It's a set of information that it captures by default. And you can't change that. So the RPC completed event captures duration, reads, writes, CPU by default. We don't have to ask for that. Our actions instead are additional things that we want SQL Server to do. We want it to go collect the client app name or collect the PID or collect the database name. So if there's some element that isn't part of that default payload that we want to capture, we add that as an action. Now, on on the left with our trace, after we've specified our events and our columns, then we set our filters. Right? We call them filters in trace. In extended events, we have a filter. You'll hear it called a predicate, right? just like you would in a query, a where clause, a predicate. And here we're saying where logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000. Then we have our next event. So our events are added separately, just as they were for trace. Our actions can be different just as our columns were different. In this case, they're exactly the same, but they can be different. And here's another notable difference. Now I've got my predicate for the SQL statement completed event. With trace, when this predicate is set up, it applies to every event that's defined. Here, I can set the predicate per event. So if I want this to be logical reads greater than equal to 10,000 and database ID equals five, I can do that they don't have to be exactly the same. This is a really cool feature of extended events. And our last part in our trace was starting up the trace. And this is again another difference. What we have here at the end of our extended event session definition is we add a target. And a target is where do I want the data to go? So with trace, if we were running a server-side trace, we had specified way back up at the top that our path is ctemp remote ug. Over here I'm specifying my path is an event file and I'm specifying that event file location just as I did for trace. It's a different type of file, it's a .xel file. 
but I can still specify the max file size. I can specify the number of rollover files that I want. But there's no start statement here. So this is just the definition of my event session. And we're going to go ahead and run this. And I'm actually going to comment out my where clause here because I don't want to worry about creating uh, a workload that generates more than 10,000 reads. And we're going to change this event session definition. And we're going to remove this filter here as well. And then as as many of you probably know, because I've already created this file, I've started this once, if I try and run it again, it's going to tell me that it can't create the file. I either have to remove this one or give a new file name. So something that you always had to pay attention to with Trace, right, um, is that you had to make sure that these file names were uniquely named. You're not going to have to worry about that with extended events. So I've created this Trace, and let's just make sure that I've got the extended event session created. Now we'll go ahead and close these windows because I don't need to do anything more with this. And I'm going to give you one more script here as part of this demo, which allows us to see the two in action side by side. So if we look at just server event sessions, this view, and also FN trace info, which we used before, they, these two statements give us basic information about each feature. So with extended events, I can see that I have the XE reads filter trace that we created. You'll also notice that we have a system health event session and we have an always on health session. If you're running SQL Server 2008 or higher, you have a system health event session running. If you're running an availability group in SQL over 2012 and higher, you've got an always on health event session that's running. They're defined, right, and system health is there. Always on health is only running if you're using an availability group. And then if I had additional event sessions defined, I would see these here as well. For my trace, I've got the default trace, and then I have the trace I created. As an aside, that system health session is not a replacement of the default trace. It does not capture the same events. It's two, it's a completely separate set of events. So now that I can see what exists, if I want to start my event session, I run this command. It's an alter event session on server. Remember how our traces were per instance, right? Per SQL Server instance. Our event sessions are the same. They're per SQL Server instance. So I'm running this for the particular instance on which I've created it and we're going to go ahead and start that up. If I hadn't started my trace already, I would run SP trace set status and get that going. Now let's run some demo queries in the background just so that we have some data of interest within our output. So those are running, that's great. And then while this is running, I've got a couple other queries that I can look at to see what's going on. I'm going to join from that server event sessions view over to DMXE sessions because this is going to let me see what's running right now. And the same can be done with sys traces to look at our traces that are active. So now I can see system health has been running since I fired up my VM this morning. And we've got the custom event session that I set up running. Always on health is not. I don't have an availability group going on here. My default trace running again since startup. And then the trace that we created had just started a couple minutes ago. So now I can see what's running. And I've let my workload go for a little bit. And when I want to stop it, I use that same alter event session command, set the state to be stopped. And for my trace, I'm going to run SP trace set status again. I input the trace ID and I set the status to zero. That stops it from running. Now at this point, I would guess that a lot of people would go through the step of removing that trace definition entirely. And you do that with the SP trace set status and setting the trace status to two. And if you didn't do that, let's say that you forgot it, or maybe you knew you were going to start the trace again, you could have done that. But when you restarted your instance, that trace definition would go away. With extended events, you do not have to drop the event session when you're done. And in fact, I re recommend not doing that. If we come in here and we look at our event session, so I've expanded management and then extended events and then sessions. You can see within this UI, which again is in SQL Server 2012 and higher, that I have this event session defined. And if I restart my interest, or excuse me, restart my instance, that session stays there. This is one of my favorite things about extended events because 
I could use templates. I have them in extended events, just like I did in Trace. But here, I've got the event session defined, and when I want to start it, for whatever reason, in response to an issue or just because I want to capture some data, I can right-click, start it up, and there we go. So these persist, and you can create as many of them as you want. I do this all the time and just leave them in client environments. But if you want to clean up when you're done, you can run drop event session on server, and again, we'll run our SP trace set status to remove that definition. So at this point, if I come back into my UI and I refresh my sessions, you'll see that that one is gone. In terms of our output, right? if I want to look at my output from that trace, this is where I might start. And I know that you've also lost time rolling through this output. This output in this format is not useful. I, mean, I, can, I can reorder my columns and I can filter down this file and I can find in it, right? If I know what I'm looking for, I can find it pretty easily. But if you really want to do analysis data, I'm guessing that you either took that and pushed it into a table and then ran all kinds of queries against it, or you used a third-party tool like ClearTrace or ReadTrace. And if you're still using, this is, this is a really important, if you're still using SQL Server 2008 R2 and below, then I'll tell you to stick with Trace, and I'll tell you to use ClearTrace and ReadTrace to do your analysis. But once you get to 2012, then we really want to start looking at using extended events. And if I look at the output file in extended events, what I can do is I can just grab that file. Ah, before I go any further, I want to make sure to point this out. Notice that this is the trace file that I created. Here is the XE file that I created. And remember, I had specified XE reads filter trace is the name of the file. But I've got this set of numbers appended to it. And SQL Server does that for us automatically. It's another thing that I love because I don't have to worry about dynamically naming the file. SQL Server does it for me. That's the number of milliseconds from January 1st, 1600, not 1700 as I've sometimes said before, 1600 to the moment that you start the trace, or excuse me, the trace, look at that Freudian slip, that you started the event session. So that number is gonna be unique every single time you create an event file. So you don't have to worry about managing those names anymore. So I can just drag this file into Management Studio and open it up. And I know that when you're looking at this view, you are not at all impressed. I'm not either. But SQL Server, the UI, Management Studio, doesn't know anything about that data. And so it only displays by default the two columns that are common to every single event, name and timestamp. But I can configure this. I can make it look like Profiler. I can highlight logical reads in that details pane, and I can say show column and table. And I can highlight my duration, and I can show the column in the table. And I can scroll down to the statement and show the column in the table. And so I can make this look just like the Profiler UI if I wanted. And I can save this view. So I can come up to display settings and say save as, and save that in my temp folder and it gets saved as this view settings file. So that the next time I open this um, output file, I can look at it in the format that I like and I can save these, um, or I can share those view setting files with my friends and you can have, have as many of them as you want. As you can see, I've got a whole bunch here. So within this window, this is where you can start to do analysis. Now, if you're bent on continuing to push the data into a table, because that's what you you know and love, then you can do that. You can export this out to a table. You cannot write data directly to a table. I often get that question. You cannot, and I'm okay with that because, again, there's a lot of overhead involved in doing that. But you can export it to a table and then do your analysis. You can also write it out to a CSV file. But in this output, I can find, just like I did within Trace, right? I can look for a particular text within a, uh, a column. I have the ability here to sort. So I can sort based on duration, ascending, descending. I can sort based on logical reads. I can group my data, which I had to write some fun queries to sometimes do with uh, T-SQL, but if I want to group by the event and look at these based on event, I can do that. And then I can actually do some aggregations right here. So I can click on aggregation and I've got duration and statement selected. 
excuse me, durational logical reads. And I can look at the average values for each of those for that grouping. So there's a lot of analysis that I can do right here in the UI. I don't need to push it to a table. I don't need a third party utility to do that. So any questions thus far? I'm going to take a second and look through and see what's I'm not sure how the audio is doing. I haven't heard anybody say anything for a while, maybe because you all left and gave up, or maybe because it's been okay. Actually, if you've got questions, I, I, think it, that? It, I think it's better. There have been a couple of times where it's gone a little quieter. And again, I think it's my connection, but I actually left where I was and went to the very center spot of my office with, okay. uh, with this laptop to see if that would help. So I think we're good. Thank you. All right, so can you use extended events with analysis services or reporting services? I will tell you that I know how to spell SQL Server analysis services and reporting services. I don't use them with either. I know that you can use it with um, analysis services. There's um, an MVP who lives in Germany, Andreas Walter, and he has some blog posts about using extended events with analysis services. Uh, in terms of reporting services, I don't believe it's there are any reporting events. We can definitely check that when we go in and we look at um, the events. So thanks, Julie, for that question. All right. Can I push a file when I write my event file target out to when I specify the location for my event file target? Let's look at that script really quick. Um, can I specify a network location as opposed to a drive letter? Do you know I've actually never tried that? Hang on. Ask me another question while I try something off screen really quick because I have never tried to do that. And I haven't tried to do that just because of the overhead that I'm concerned that would be involved with that. Meaning if I write to my local drive, right, it's going to be way faster than if I have to go across the network. And so I want to limit that overhead where I can. But let me just see if I can do it. So hold on. I'm doing something off screen, which is why you're not seeing happening, anything happening, because I can magically, for better or worse, connect to a client environment and make a change on the fly. So let's see. Any other questions while I'm trying to give that a whirl? No. Okay, well that's fine. I get how it is. Hold on one sec. So what I'm doing is, and I'm doing this through the UI, and we're going to take a look at that in a second, but I'm going to add that event file, and instead of pushing it to one location, we're going to write to a different drive entirely. You can hear me typing, I'm sure. It lets me save it, and it lets me start the event session. So it looks like it. So to answer your question, it looks like, yes, I could write the file over the network. I don't know that I would, but it looks like you can do it, right? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, let's see. All right. I'm going to go on and talk. We're going to flip back to the slides for a few minutes, and then we're going to come back and look at this again, but through the UI. The T-SQL, I don't expect people, just so that we're clear, to create every single event session through using T-SQL. It's how I want you to make that leap from what you know in Trace over to extended events. Our next demo is going to come back and look at that UI, but I want to talk through a couple items real quick first. So I've talked about our events, right, and we did SP statement completed and RPC completed. And the events are points of interest in the application, right? Interesting things within uh, SQL Server that happen. So a data file auto grow is one example, or a sort warning, or object created. These are events that we capture in the default trace. Lock acquired, a statement recompile, a deadlock graph, right? Different events, different points in the code that are interesting to us where we might want to get more information. And when we look at the events between trace and extended events, there's a pretty good mapping, a pretty good understanding of if I know trace and I know my events, I can find a comparable event within extended events. They're not exactly named the same, but they're pretty close. 
Now, there's a couple important things to understand about these events. There wasn't a comparable event for everyone in Trace in Extended Events until SQL Server 2012. This is another reason that I tell you if you're running 2008 R2 and below to stick with Trace. Because you may try and do something in 2008 or 2008 R2, but the event isn't there yet. They're all there in 2012. And if you want to understand the mapping, right, if you know the Trace event and aren't sure of the Extended Events event, you can use the Trace XE event map um, dynamic management object for that. Now, the other thing to remember is that the audit feature was introduced in SQL Server, I think it might have been 2008, but in 2012, all of the events for audit should be captured using the audit feature. So you'll see in Trace the audit login event, and in extended events you'll see an event called login, but those are not the same two events. So anything related to auditing should be done with the audit feature. Now in terms of the number of events per version of SQL Server, in the current release, 2016 Service Pack 1, we have over 1,300 different events. And my quiz here is, do you know how many different events there are in Trace? And the number of events in Trace is the same for all of these versions of SQL Server. And it's a whopping 180. So I had said, remember when I talked in the beginning about packages and events and all of that and how extended events is really flexible because as new features are added, those events for those features can be part of extended events. That's the way that it was architected and with trace, those events aren't being presented. So if you want to do anything, any, any information capture or digging into or understanding about availability groups or in-memory OLTP or column store or buffer pool extensions or query store, those events are only found in extended events. You're not going to see them in trace. Every event has that default payload. It's a set of information that's always returned. You don't have the ability to change that, so you can't go in and configure it. Um, there's a little bit of an asterisk there because there are some elements that you can select or unselect for collection, but you can't reconfigure what uh, elements it collects by default. Your predicates are really powerful. I, I showed you that those predicates are per event, which is very different than trace. And that determines whether or not the event's going to fire and whether we collect information. And you can use those predicates on that default payload information or on something we call global predicate source fields. And I'm going to go back into the demo for one second and show you something related to this, these predicates, which is called the short circuit evaluation. So imagine here that I have logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000 and duration greater than, let's say it's 10,000 milliseconds or 10 seconds. And we'll just be greater than or equal to, not plus, equal to. So the way that this comes in, the way that SQL Server does this evaluation is it evaluates whatever's first and then continues on down the line. And the moment that it hits something that is true, it stops evaluating. So here, logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000. So let's say that we're doing this for this SQL statement completed event. And so each the event comes in and it says, OK, are your reads greater than or equal to 10,000? They are? OK, I'm done. I don't even care what your duration is because you met this criteria. Next one comes in. Are your reads greater than or equal to 10,000? They are great. Don't even care about duration. Next query comes in. Are your logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000? Oh, they're not. Well, OK, then we're done there. You know what? I totally was explaining this wrong. And those of you that are following along are like, what are you talking about? Hold on. Logical reads greater than and duration is this. Logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000. Are yours greater? They are. Is your duration greater than 10 seconds? It is. I'm keeping you. Logical reads greater than 10,000, it is. Is your duration greater than 10 seconds? No, then I'm not going to capture you. If it's an and, right, if it's true, it has to keep going all the way down. If it's false, it stops evaluating. So if the logical reads are not greater than 10,000, then it doesn't even care about duration. And I mention this because the order that you write this is important when you're using an and, and also when you're using an or. 
but with an and, whatever is going to be least likely is what I want to have first so that it kicks out earlier in the process. So if I have a lot of queries that have logical reads greater than 10,000, but they don't typically take 10 seconds to run, then it has to evaluate logical reads first every single time and then check the duration. But if I change this order, so let's take duration and put it here. Now it's going to come in and say, okay, is my duration greater than 10,000? Is it greater than 10 seconds? Nope. Then I'm done. It doesn't even care about logical reads. It does that every single time. And so if this is less likely, then I'm going to put this first. Different than if I do an or, right? The and means they both have to be true. And once, it's once, once one of them is false, it's done. So it short circuits here if it's not greater than 10 seconds. If I change it to be an or, then it says, okay, is my duration greater than 10 seconds? It's not. Well, is my reads greater than 10,000? It is. So if most of my queries are not greater than 10 seconds, and I'm using an or, then flipping these around to go the other way is better when I use the or. Are my logical reads greater than 10,000? That's true. It doesn't need to evaluate any further. If this is false, then it will continue. Okay, so that short circuit evaluation works in an opposite way for an or versus an and. And so think about that when you're writing these predicates, because if I can get it to drop out of that logic earlier, because it hit a true condition or a false condition, depending on whether I'm using and and or, that's a good thing. It's microseconds, probably in terms of time, but depending upon what event I'm capturing and this filter, that, could, that can add up over time. So really pay attention to how you configure those filters. And again, they can operate on that default payload data or you can, uh, they can operate on the predicate source fields. I have a couple questions, let me take of that. Let me take a look at those. The position, so the question, there's a question about if the positioning matters for the and, and it does. They both have to be true. So I'm gonna change this back to an and and I'm gonna change my duration to be first. Never type in a demo, and I just am doing it all over the place here. These both have to be true for the event to fire. So if my duration is very rarely over 10 seconds, then I put this first, because it comes in and it says, is the duration greater than 10 seconds? Nope, I don't even care what the reads are. Next query comes in, is the duration greater than 10 seconds? Nope. I don't even care what the reads are because it immediately val validates to false, so it's done checking. Okay, so does that where rule apply to all queries in SQL? This the short circuit evaluation is specific that I'm talking about right now is specific to extended events. All right, what else? Donna, hopefully that answered your question. If not, send me an email to follow up. Okay, so predicates. Something to pay attention to with regards to those predicates. Um, you can filter on the default payload. You can filter on um, the global predicate fields as well. If you filter on something that's not part of that default payload, SQL Server has to go get that information before it can do predicate evaluation. So if I filter on duration or logical reads, that's part of the default payload, that information is right there. If I filter on something like database ID, which isn't part of the default payload, it has to go get that information before it can do predicate evaluation. And there is, again, a cost to that. So something to pay attention to. If I don't have everything I need in that default payload, I can use actions. I can go have it collect my database ID. I can, have a, I can have it collect my session ID. I can also do some pretty interesting things like have it create a dump file for the current thread or create the dump file for everything on the server. That's rather dangerous and expensive. So use those actions wisely. 
The thing about the actions is they only execute if the predicate evaluates to true. So predicate evaluation happens first and then those actions execute. And you have to think about these actions also because they add overhead as well. It's additional information that SQL Server has to go and collect or run for you. And some of those have big side effects. Um, some of those actions have a lot of overhead. Um, capturing the T-SQL stack can be very expensive. And that, that isn't, I have to say that that's not well documented and that's unfortunate. Um, and it's one of those things that you just start to figure out over time. But if you have an event that fires frequently and you're capturing expensive actions, um, that can potentially affect performance. So it's something to pay attention to. Now we had to pay attention to performance with, it, with Trace and we still have to pay attention to it with extended events, even though extended events is more lightweight. And the last thing that I want to mention here is related to targets, right? I said that the target is where do I want to write the data? And thinking of it as what's going to consume your data is another way to look at that. Um, the event file is the only target listed here where the data persists after the event session stops. The ring buffer target, the event counter target, the histogram target, and the event pairing target are four targets that are memory resident which means that when the event session stops, that data goes away. And so if you're thinking, well, why would I even use them? It's because those last three, in particular, histogram and event pairing, can do aggregations and matching for you that it's really tricky to do manually. The, the event counter target just counts how many times an event fires, which doesn't seem so exciting, but it's really useful for troubleshooting. right? If I, and actually, to start out, if I want to... Uh, run an event session on a server and I have no idea of the workload, using the event counter is a good idea to, to help me understand how often an event fires. The histogram target groups events based on some criteria. For example, I have my SP statement completed event and I could add database ID and I could bucket, I could group based on that database ID using the histogram target and it will organize that data based on database ID for me. Now I could capture it in raw form in the event file and do it, but I can let SQL Server do it with the histogram target. The event pairing target is unmatched event. So it pairs events based on criteria, like an SP statement started and an SP statement completed, and it returns the event that doesn't match. So it's good for troubleshooting something like um, a uh, timeout issue where the statement starts but you don't get a complete, but you have to be really careful uh, on what you match on. So if we think about a big picture of extended events, the first thing that happens when it encounters an event is it looks to see if the is enabled flag is set to true. And if it is, keep on collecting information. And then collect that payload data, that default payload data and then perform predicate evaluation. So if we're evaluating on something that's not part of the default payload, it has to go get it right here in order to do predicate evaluation. If the predicate evaluates to true, then publish the event or you'll see the event fire. Then run any actions to capture additional data. Serve up my data to a synchronous target, which means it has to go on the exact same thread that it fired on. Only the event counter is the synchronous target. And then for all the other targets, like the event file, the ring buffer, the histogram, and pair matching, it puts the event data into memory buffers. And it holds it there until it can write it out to the target. Profiler and Trace worked in a similar way. So there's an intermediate step here where data is being held in memory before it goes out to that target location that consumes the data. So now, now let's take a look at our event session creation within the UI. So let's open up our demo again. And I'm going to open up a script just to have as reference there in case I need it. And in this case, I could go ahead and run the T-SQL but how to create these event sessions within the UI as well. So I'm going to refresh, and we don't have any sessions created other than the default ones. So to create a new one, we go right-click and then Create New Session. You can use the new session wizard, but it doesn't give you the same options. It doesn't give you everything. Therefore, I don't like to use it. I like to use new session. 
And within new session, I have to give it a name. So we're going to call it track queries. And as I had mentioned, we have templates in extended events, just as I did in trace. We have them in here. You can create new ones. You can add um, template groups as well as separate templates. If you're interested in creating an event session that looks like the default trace, the activity tracking template is the one for you. There's, some couple, there's a couple cool things here with extended events that we don't have in Trace. The first is I can have this event session start when the instance starts. So to handle that with Trace, you had to uh, have a script or a stored procedure, a system stored procedure that ran when the instance started up or an agent job or something so that it would start that way. This is part of the event session definition. So I can have it start when the instance starts and it will keep running until it, sends, until it shuts down or until someone stops it. Um, I also have this really cool option called causality tracking. In Trace, I would bet that there were times when you tried to understand the order of events, right? What happened for a particular session ID in what order? So you'd add session ID and you'd add transaction ID and who knows what else and you'd be looking at the start time to try and understand what happened in what order. You don't have to do that anymore. SQL Server will do that for you with this track causality option. It, it adds a GUID to every event along with a sequence number so that you can, so all of the events for, uh, that are related are tracked with the same GUID and then there's a sequence number so you can see what order they happened in. I'll check that box so we can take a quick look at it. Then I've got my events window. Remember, I talked about how much time you have spent scrolling in this and you don't have to scroll any longer. You can now type SP statement and it will give you a short list of your events. Or I can type SQL statement and it will give me a short list of my events as well. It makes it much easier to find events. And one of the things to note here is that I've got a group of, I've got categories that break down this information. I don't come in here and mess with this at all, but if you wanted to look at events just related to security, you could do that. I've got channels. And debug is a channel that's not selected by default. You probably don't need the debug events often, but if you're ever not finding an event, use the debug option. So for example, I know that there are some events related to Paul Randall's favorite thing, DBCC. I'm looking right now in events only, but I can look in the descriptions in the event fields, and if I pick all, I still don't see more than one event, but I know there's more than one. So check this debug option and now I see that I've got five different events because it's searching the details pane for me and I've got to make sure I've got all the events selected. And remember I said that default payload information? This is where you can see that down here in the bottom right. So I've selected this database's DBCC logical scan event and if we look down here you can see that these events are included by default. You can also see that when we go over to configure the event. So way over here on the right side, and I'm drawing a couple boxes here so you can see where I am, you have to hit this configure tab button, excuse me, to configure the events in terms of the predicates and uh, any actions that you want. The number of events in the configuration is just too complex to fit on one screen. So we select the events here and then you hit configure figure and it slides on over and now I've got the events listed on the left side of the screen and if I drop over to this event fields tab this is the default payload and remember I said that you can't change it and then I said but you can sometimes check or uncheck columns this is where you would do that so for SP statement completed I can include object name if I want I don't need to I'm already getting object ID but if I didn't want to look it up I could grab object name as well but I can't change anything in this configuration here. So I can look at the default payload and then I can come into my predicate or my filter tab and I can add my predicates. And I can select one event, two events, all of them, and I can add this filter for both of them. Or again, I can add them separately. I could come in here and add a different field for SQL statement completed. For this event session, I'm just making sure that I'm not looking at system events. And then for global fields, I can add, I can't remember for certain what I added here, so let's check database ID and I'm not sure what else, but we're going to go with that for now. And I only did that for SQL statement completed. I can add it for both if I want or just for one. 
then I need to determine where I want this data to go, right? What is my target? And if I look at this drop down, you'll see the list of different targets that I had mentioned here. We're going to stick with event file because that's what we're most familiar with from trace. But for this example, I'm also going to add the ring buffer. So understand that I can add two or more targets. I don't have to just write to one. So we'll make sure that this goes to ctemp so I can find it easily. I always set a max file size of 512 megs or lower because otherwise those files get a little bit unwieldy when I'm loading them or just viewing them. I'm going to add my ring buffer target. And the number of events to keep, you need to set a value for either the number of events or for the max memory size that you allocate. Um, set this to four, there's a bug related to the ring buffer where you're not going to see more than four megs of data anyway. Always, always, always set a reasonable number here. Set this to be less than the amount of memory available on your machine. Four is a plenty fine number for the ring buffer target. And then within our advanced tab, I don't usually make changes in here unless I've really got a high volume system. One of the things you might want to do is you can bump up that intermediate memory size. It defaults to 4 megs. Sometimes I bump it up to 16. 16 megs on a 64 gig server isn't really that much. On a 256 gig server or 512, it's definitely not that much. But for those larger volume systems, you may have to change this configuration a bit. But for today, we're just going to leave it as is. And then we'll go ahead and say OK. And at that point, our event session is created. So I'm going to run my script just to make sure I created it how I wanted. And then we're going to go ahead and start it. And again, I could have done this through the UI. I can right click and start session. Now you can see it's running. If I expand this, you can see that I have the two different targets, my event file and my ring buffer. Now I can look at them right from here. So I can right click and I can say view target data and it's going to show me everything that's been written to the event file. So So far, which is absolutely nothing because I'm not running any of my code. So once I file back and I now say view target data, now I have some data. So this is what's been written to the event file so far. This is going to be static. It's still writing to the event file, but I said show me what's in there at this point in time. If I want to look at the ring buffer, I can do that too, but it shows up in this lovely XML format, which isn't too great in terms of doing analysis. If I really want to look at this data, I have to write some X query, which thankfully I have someone else that's done that for me. I also have the ability to view live data. So this is just like in the profiler UI where data comes streaming in. Okay, now some people say this doesn't come in fast enough, it doesn't come in, you can lower it to come in like every one second, but I think that most of the time this is pretty pretty adequate. A thing that extended events does a little bit better than trace is that if pushing data into this live data view creates too much overhead on the server and starts to impact performance, it will disconnect that. Um, Profiler wouldn't do that. If Profiler was dragging the server down, it didn't care. It still kept doing its thing. It's a little bit different with extended events. The maximum number of rows that you can see in here is one million. Um, trying to do analysis on one million rows is, is pretty tricky, so I think that's an adequate max. I can stop viewing this at any time when they stop the data feed. The event session is still running, data is still getting written out to the buffer, it's still getting written to the event file, but I can sit here and I can play with this data. So I could scroll over and I could look at my statement and I could group by my statement, right? So this might take a little, it's not too bad. But what you see here is that I have a lot of literal queries that are running. So I have two instances of this query. One instance, two, three. Um, if I use trace and, and I have a way to handle that within SQL Server as well. So let me come into this grouping and rather than group on the statement, I want to group on something else that I want to collect which is the query plan hash and the query hash. So remember in SQL Server 2008, the query hash and query plan hash were introduced and it's like a query fingerprint and every query has its own query hash. Rather than grouping on the statement, which could be different because of different literal values, right? If we scroll over here, 
you'll see that this query has a literal value of first name and last name. And it's going to be different for every variation of that. So I can't really group on it. I can group on the query hash, and that's going to work a little bit better. I know it's 105. I'm hurrying to wrap up. Stay with me if you can. Okay. <laughs> so let me hop back over here. What's that, Ree? I just giggled. <laughs> okay. So the other thing, remember I was writing out to that ring buffer? for target and I tried to look at it in the UI and it wasn't pretty. I can take this, I can't take any credit for it, but I'll use it. And we declare a XML variable and then we pull the data into that and parse it because sometimes that's more efficient than querying the data directly. And when we run this, you'll see that at this point we've processed over 80,000 events and I can see about 1,700 of them here in this view. And the ring buffer target is a in-memory target, it's a first in, first out target. So as that space fills up, when it fills up, old events are going to be kicked out. So if I run this and I see now I have 88,000 processed, but I still only have about 1,700 in here. So that ring buffer is, is really a temporary target. Data is not going to persist in there. Now, if I want to make a ch change to my event session, this is something I really like. If you wanted to change your trace, you had to stop the trace and make your change. I can change my event session on the fly. So I can come in here and I can drop the events. And so drop event session, excuse me, alter event session, drop event, SQL statement completed, SP statement completed. If I come back here and look at my live data and I fire this up, nothing's going to come in here. Because even though the event session is running, I don't have any events assigned to it. And if I look in my ring buffer and I look at the output here, you'll see that I've got 97,000 events processed. And if I run this again, it's still 97,000 events because it's not capturing anything new. So I could do that, and I could sit here and I could look at some of this data in memory if I wanted. Or I could come back and I can alter my event session and I can add these two events back in. And this time when I do that, I'm going to also include the query hash and that query plan hash that I mentioned. So we're going to run this again. And if I come back and look at my live data, we're going to start to see some data spill in here. And if I come back and look in the ring buffer, I was at 97,000 events. Now I'm at over 100,000 events. So it's a really cool way to alter the event session without stopping the event session. And now you'll see I have this query hash in here, so I'm going to let a few thousand events come in. And then rather than group on my statement, which gave me a lot of one and two and three entries because I've got queries with literal values, if I group on my query hash, now I get something a little bit better, right? I see that for this select from sales order detail, I have 19 entries. And if I looked at at my select against my customer ID where I have different first names and last names, right? Even though these values are different, here's Marie, here is Hannah, they all get grouped together because they have the same query hash. So I don't need a third party tool. I can still find that query that's a death by a thousand cuts that runs 4,900 times in a short time time span because I can group based on that query hash instead. I still have that information flowing into the ring buffer and it's going to stay there until I come back here and I stop that event session. When I stop the event session and then query the ring buffer, all that information is gone. So the event file is the only thing that's going to persist out there on disk after I have stopped the event session, right? This file right here. And this is pretty decent size in terms of how much data it's got in it at this point. And because I altered those events halfway through, some of the events in here will have the query hash and some of them won't because I changed the event, se event session definition halfway through. So kind of a, a something to pay attention to if you mess with that. You can't change the options for the event session here, like I can't change causality tracking or change the schedule or change anything on the advanced tab. I can only change things related to the events and related to the targets. I can actually remove a target and add a target on the fly as well. Any questions about this demo in the UI? Let me look to see what I've got here. Would auto grow be an expensive event to capture? I sure hope not, meaning if I'm auto growing a lot, which I can't think I would be, 
then it could be expensive, but in general, I wouldn't think that an auto grow would be an expensive event to track. Is there an event to use when you want to track all queries that are not using indexes? No, that's, that's an easy button and a magical option that doesn't exist. Um, I, you'd have to mine the plan cache to look for queries that don't use any indexes, and I don't know how efficient that kind of query would be. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to slowly go back to the slides. A couple things related to performance that I want to mention. There are still specific events that are expensive in extended events. The query post execution show plan is one of them. I know that people use this in trace. Um, it kind of makes me sad because it is a very high impact event. And within here, if I come in here and I look for performance and I look in all of this. Oh, sorry. That's what happens when I hit enter when I don't mean to. Um, I want to look for performance and I want to look in all. And here we go. Here's my qu query post compilation execution show plan events. Notice the, this warning down here. Using this event can have significant performance overhead, so it should only be used when troubleshooting or monitoring specific problems for brief periods of time. These are expensive events. They were expensive in Trace. They are still expensive here. So that's something to pay attention to when you're configuring your event sessions. If I filter on elements that are not part of the default payload, that are those global state data fields, that adds overhead. Adding my actions, the elements that are not part of the default payload, also adds overhead. And even though I might have a lot of memory on my server, I still want to set limits, particularly when I'm using something like the ring buffer target, so that I don't run into problems related to resource use. There's a lot of people that I've talked to about using extended events compared to trace, and one of the biggest complaints that I hear is that it takes too much time. And I will agree that in the beginning it does take time. Anytime you're learning, some, learning something new, when you're migrating from a feature that you've used for 5, 10, 15, 19 years, um, it takes time to learn how to do something else. Uh, it'll take longer for, for everything initially. But it's quite possible, and I have challenged people to create event sessions in the same amount of time as they've created a trace, and I actually did a, a test myself, and it's absolutely possible. And with the fact that you can have those event sessions persist between restarts, it's just as fast, if not faster, to, to start up the event session compared to starting a trace using a template. One thing that I've heard grumbling about is that you can't integrate perfmon data with extended events output. The extended events team actually didn't know that was an option in trace, and they didn't make it available in extended events. Um, I've heard people say it's something they never use. I've had people say that they use it a lot. Um, you can still look at that, wind that, look at that data in two windows, but it doesn't pull in directly to the UI like it did with trace. If you use the histogram target, you can only bucket on one field. And if you use distributed replay, you still need to use trace files. Now remember that distributed replay was made available in 2012, and the whole purpose of distributed replay is to get people to upgrade. Prior to SQL Server 2008, there was no extended events. So distributed replay had to be written with that in mind, and that's why it still currently uses trace files. Um, eventually, over time, hopefully to use XDL files, you can convert them to trace files. Um, if you so desire. I love that I can have multiple event sessions and then I just start and stop them as needed. This is one of the easiest things to me to understand. Um, I love that I can search for my events. I don't have to scroll anymore. I wasted days, I think, scrolling up and down in that UI. Um, the track causality option, which I didn't even have a chance to show you, is very helpful when you're troubleshooting. I can write to multiple targets and I can work with data within Management Studio. Um, and it's a lot easier to manipulate and do aggregations and searches and filtering on that data than in the profiler UI. So my challenge to you this afternoon or tomorrow or Friday or next week when you need to use trace is to try to use extended events instead. Create the trace maybe and then use John's script to migrate it over to extended events or try to do it in the UI. 
Uh, if you have questions, definitely email me. And if you're really struggling, I'd love to hear about it. I've got a post out there trying to help understand why people avoid extended events. And I've got some great questions out there, and I've posted some suggestions. So if that ends up being you, please let me know. Um, again, I've got a plural site course on replacing profiler with extended events. This was a short hour and 15 minutes or so. I think that course is like three hours long. That's just talking about um, the stuff that we've gone through here. John has um, an introduction to extended events, and then he's got an advanced course beyond that. So there's like seven or nine hours of content out there on plural site. And we've got some documentation out on SQL Server Central and in some blog posts. And there's a couple utilities here related to extended events as well well. So thank you for having me. Thank you for staying a little bit beyond. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, but I appreciate all of you taking the time and giving me the opportunity to talk about extended events today. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate you doing the session for us. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we will try to get this um, uploaded to the um, WIT YouTube page by the end of the day. Um, and um, uh, if you registered with your email address, a link should go out, um, and Erin has said she'll send us the, uh, her slide deck, correct? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. So um, I don't know if you're, if you're still looking at the questions. Um, I don't see I, um, there. The only one that I, that I didn't answer was if extended events would be better to troubleshoot memory pressure over Perfmon. And... Um, there, it's initially that's not the direction I would go. Um, extended events definitely has its uses. Um, sometimes it's it's a, a, a better option than say using the DMVs, but sometimes the DMVs are better to use. So in terms of memory pressure, it depends on what kind of memory pressure I'm having and and how it's manifesting. So maybe, but I wouldn't discard Perfmon entirely. I think Perfmon is still a great tool to use. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. We really, really appreciate it. Erin, we would love to have you back for a future Anytime. webinar. Anytime. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks.